that it is in better shape. But what it does show is that there are multiple opportunities in their system where we have remedy and relief. And even if we're dealing with the most difficult and corrupt and unjust systems, it is important to remember what is available in the system already. And at the end of the day, all the material we do is about helping you and the demystification of what is happening with the courts. Well, tonight we jumped around a few things. It was important, I think, to cover at the end there some of those practical issues because I know that they're uh, issues that are, are being faced by many and it will be made clearer. And I know that uh, a number of you still face very, very serious legal matters. But tonight also was very much about the bigger picture and about the power of your mind. And I hope you have a chance to read the link of cognitive law that I mentioned at the beginning. And I look forward to making that available publicly through the, the site over the next few days. And when people talk to you about coming doom, pending doom, that we are uh, in the front of a freight train and nothing can stop us, I hope that you come back to this recording and the visualisation that we did on giving Mars life. Because nothing is written in stone. If it was, there would be no free will. And this is totally against the laws of the universe. You, you alone, have the ability to change destiny. Collectively, you have the ability to change destiny. And I hope and I do pray that you will share your expanding knowledge with others so that they too can positively visualize and realize that life is a dream. A dream has rules. And the sun, as a conscious member, of one heaven, like you, has made its decision to help and not destroy. Thanks very much, and I look forward to your questions. And we've reached uh, the end of the hour, so I'm going to go through and see what questions there are and see who'd like to talk. If you want to speak, please click on uh, hash eight or star eight, and I look forward to, uh, to speaking with a number of you. So let me have a look and see if we've got any questions here, uh, what we have. Okay, uh, I've got a question here. Um, uh, hi Frank, and this is from Wolfpath. I was born in Germany and became a Canadian citizen when I was a teenager. Does that mean that my citizen certificate was monetized? Yes, it does. Uh, uh, yes, it does. And uh, you were, your birth was monetized. Uh, you, a number of bonds were issued against you up until the age, well, are issued against you normally up until the age of 30. And uh, they monetize everything. They monetize your marriage. They monetize your employment contract. They monetize your promissory notes for your home. Um, they monetize everything, yes. Uh, question by guest 29. Uh, how then is elocution done right to offer dismissal? Example. Uh, please, I want to find example in your work. This is important, guest 29, and this is something that we need to uh, provide to you. And I, I do promise that this is something that is going to be added to the University of Ucada as a matter of priority. Uh, I've asked... Uh, one who has quite a deal of experience in this area, Greg Pappas, uh, that if he can provide some of his knowledge in this area. So hopefully we might hear from Greg tonight. And if we do hear from Greg, it would be great to see if he can give us some uh, information on this. If not, um, I will look to see that we have something on University of Eucadia and we'll have it on the other sites as it comes up. Uh, as to the specific approach on elocution, uh, I'd rather come back to you and look to the material because it's not an area that I have to say uh, I have focused exactly on the best form of elocution to maximise the prospect of dismissal. What I, what I will say is there are 
numerous cases that an elocution perfected even after one has been sentenced criminally has caused a dismissal. It has been done and it can be done. So I look forward to those notes and we hopefully we'll hear from, uh, from Greg, as I said, uh, later on. If anyone wants to speak, please go uh, star eight or hash eight and uh, look forward to hearing from you. Um, I have a question here. Uh, have you read the Urantia book? Uh, I have read a number of texts by groups that claim at various levels to represent some uh, galactic consciousness or represent some uh, uh, group um, of, uh, of aliens, for want of a better word. And my gut feel in many cases, and I may, may be ego, that it hasn't sat well with me. Uh, one thing is that uh, when, uh, when the history that they provide doesn't gel with the history that is embedded in our ancestors back to the very first civilizations, that gives me cause for concern. Because what I've seen more and more in my studies and research and, and reflection is that there is a wealth of knowledge that our ancestors knew that we have been taught to discount as myth. Yet all our ancestors said, and especially the Sumerians and the early civilizations said, that not only were we genetically created, but we were created by blood and flesh beings that had reptilian aspects to them. So the structures that they speak of in many cases do not gel with the more X-Files influenced type work that I've seen in a number of these groups. I'm not saying that it's all, all wrong because I think there's an essence of truth in everything, but my feeling uh, so far has been that many of these groups that have set themselves up to claim to be the ambassadors, if you like, of some galactic consciousness uh, are really people who have seen a gap and filled it rather than being genuine. That's my personal feeling. Um, let's see uh, if we've got some uh, questions. Can I just ask, can people tell, tell me, oh, here we go, we'll, I've got a, an audio here, so let me call it in. I've got uh, uh, Greg, let me see if I can just, can you hear me? Hi Frank. Hi. I uh, I was chatting with Gerald before the call, so we'll get the allocution information together as soon as we can. And I didn't realize, I guess, at the time after I started studying with you, how important this really is and how it ties in with everything you've been teaching. So, um, what what is it you wanted me to cover right now on the allocution? Well. The question we asked, and I, and I think it's a question that everyone wants to, wants to know, is that is there a way, just in the in the brief moment now, um, firstly, can you are you going to be able to write something for folk to go and have a look at the back of University of Ucada on elocution? Is this something that you can look at over the next week or so? Yes, no, I'll, I'll work on something. I'll, I'll put an outline right. together and take notes that I've already had and compile it into right. a structure and maybe have Ron review it with me. Okay. So that's that's the first, and, I, and thank you, Greg. I know that everyone will appreciate that. The second question is, um, can you just confirm for the benefit of others that it is in fact true that when an elocution is perfected in the right manner, that even criminally convicted ca cases where a sentence of a criminal conviction has been passed, that the elocution has caused the case to be dismissed? Yes, and let me let me um, put a uh, I guess a caveat on that. The first time I saw an allocution done was in I, and I don't remember what year this case was, but I can cite the case. It was ninety seven or nineteen ninety eight. It was a U.S. United States District Court case. Uh, the United States um, it was an IRS case, DOJ Department of Justice case against a man named Francis Anthony Marafino, and that was in Los Angeles. And the judge on that was Dean. D. Pragerson, who I believe was in courtroom number two, it was a, um, his father was a, um, 
appellate court judge at the time. So I remembered the elocution that we put together for that case, and it was my first experience of working with somebody and putting one together. And the um, man had like about, a, I don't know, 90 pages or something that he typed out to read it. And he started to read it at elocution, and, and he was asked by Judge Pregerson how much time he was going to need after he had his sentencing. And uh, he said, well, I need a lot more time than you're trying to cut me off for now. And I watched uh, Judge Pregerson uh, sit back in his chair and said, continue to take as much time as you need. So obviously that was a U.S. District Court judge who knew exactly um, he did not want his uh, dis- or the final decision in the case overturned by, by lack of uh, opportunity to present the full allocution. Although, I must tell you, the one thing I noticed with this man, uh, Frank Marafino at the time, was that he uh, he got nervous. And we'd spent the whole day with him beforehand trying to coach him into thinking clearly about what he was going to do and what he was going to say and to take his time and read the whole thing on the record and don't stop. And of course, this is, this is prior to me knowing fully all the details of, about um, all the affidavits, but he had literally every every piece of evidence that was not allowed or was restricted to motions in limine by the prosecution were, were in this document. <clears throat> I do I do remember um, oh, when we were sitting at sentencing, I reminded him before he went in to make sure that he um, he needs to walk out of the courtroom. Now, it was a very frightening thing in this courtroom. This was a big case. The LA Times was covering it and a number of other media sources, and there must have been 20 of us in the courtroom, and there were at least 20 U.S. Marshals there, so it was very to him. <clears throat> so um, when it came time to actually complete the you know, and to state on the record that he wasn't going to jail or wasn't going to prison, he wasn't going to be fined or any, any of the issues of monetary aspects or any restrictions to his freedom, um, he, uh, he sort of halfway said it, and then instead of uh, gathering up all of his papers and turning and walking out of the bar, and out of the courtroom, he sort of just stood there. And so mm. to me, the key was that, that it, it's, it's the intention of the confidence as to who we are. So if it was me, you know, no matter how nervous I get, no matter how much kind of stress they would try to place on me, upon me, I would, I would uh, you know, like, like uh, the minister in California did, I know, just gather all the stuff together, state on the record unequivocally that I'm not going to prison, I don't, agree to any new contracts with him. If he tries to recontract with me, I'm not going to accept it. And just uh, turn and walk out of the courtroom. And, you know, um, for public consumption, if media is there, it, we've been told that there's been times where somebody will be taken back into custody and don't resist. Like 20 U.S. Marshals in a courtroom. But um, usually what's happened is, is that the people have been released after the media is all gone. And, and there's and we're set about it again, and the case is sealed. Um, mm. I, I, I mean, this is a this is a brave area. Most of the great teachers who even taught me this do not get their people to complete this process. There's too much fear. But we had a case in Texas where a man we we coached him for several weeks before sentencing, and we told him not to file his allocution, and he filed it anyways. And the judge told him that he took note. This was in a U.S. District Court IRS case, and the judge took note of the uh, of the um, allocution and that he didn't need to read it. Well, we told him no matter what the judge says, read it anyways, even if you did file it. Well, he didn't file it. And, uh, and the one interesting thing in that case was that the judge offered him um, time to appeal uh, his, his, his the, 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 the decision, in other words, the sentence to appeal the case, and that he if he filed a notice of appeal within, I think, 30 days or something or 40 days, whatever it is, I don't remember this, the number, <clears throat> that he would not um, take him into custody until the appeal was, you know, ran all the way its course. If he took it all the way to the Supreme Court uh, in D.C., it, he would have not been taken into custody. Ironically, we have agents all around us that put themselves up as gurus, and in this case it was, mm. a, and I don't think it's, it's, it's teaching anymore, but um, he was in Texas, and I'm going to name names. I, I, I can name names. This is on me, not on you, and on the Ukadia call. I, I'll name names. And this was uh, Rice McLeod, um, who's also top people like Winston Shroud and Sam Davis, all of which I think are agents. That's my opinion. Mm. You know, that, that I have some evidence to back it up, but I can't present it on a call right now. But the point mm. is, is that he, he called up this, this dentist friend of ours and told him that he needed to withdraw 
the uh, the uh, notice of, of a 